If you have a study Bible, or, or even if it's not a study Bible, it may say right above this verse, right above this psalm, a song of degrees of David. We call David the sweet psalmist of Israel. I think it's kind of funny we call him the sweet psalmist. I don't know why we call him that. He is the one that cut Goliath's head off, you know. Uh, he is the one that, uh, when he wanted to marry uh, the king's daughter, he went out and killed a bunch of Philistines and brought their foreskins back to his father-in-law. I mean, he's... I don't know if you'd call him a sweet little boy. I mean, he was a tough, tough guy. But nevertheless, he was a poet. He was a psalmist, and he uh, wrote probably over half of the psalms in this book of psalms. And he was uh, blessed with uh, musical ability and poetic ability, and certainly some of his words are, are of great comfort and great value to us. For instance, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we know Psalm 23 to be such a wonderful passage of Scripture, and David wrote that. As David writes here, and he says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I want you to know that David, when he writes this, he knows all too well, he knows all too well what disunity and division is like. You see, David was writing from a perspective where he was no stranger to Saul trying to kill him, try to murder him, try to take his life. Remember Saul, I think sometimes when we read that story, we forget that Saul was his father-in-law. He was supposed to be part of his family. Now, that's maybe a little foreign to us because usually it's the mother-in-law trying to kill uh, the son-in-law, but in this case it was the father-in-law. And Saul did try and kill him several times personally. And then there were other times where he tried to scheme and connive and really orchestrate his death. And I think that it's if you read the Bible, I, I may be mistaken here, but over 40 times he took an attempt on David's life. And so David knows what it's like to have disunity and division within his family. Also, without spending too much time on it, remember, David experienced it in his own family as well. You remember that terrible story, one of the most unspeakable stories in the Bible, where Amnon fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. He ends up, through the influence of a friend, violating his sister and then Absalom, his brother, gets angry because he violated their sister, and he orchestrates the murder of Amnon, and so you have brother violating sister, and then other brother murdering brother, all within David's family. He knows what dysfunction and disunity looks like. Not only that, after all of that heartbreak was done, you can imagine the disunity that existed between David and his son Absalom, and because Absalom was hurt by all of that, Absalom then tries to divide the kingdom. He sits outside the gates and he says, you know, if I were the king, if I were the king, I wouldn't handle things that way and I wouldn't do you that way. Why don't you give me an opportunity to be your king? And he ends up dividing the kingdom and you know a civil war ensued. What I'm trying to say to you is that David knew exactly what he was talking about when he wrote this verse Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because he knew firsthand how terrible, how ugly, how awful, how disruptive, how unpleasant it is when brethren dwell together in disunity. And so he writes this great psalm. He understood the benefits and the beauty of unity. But I think we need to pause for just a moment as we're talking about this subject of unity. We need to ask ourselves the question, what is unity? What exactly is it? Here's a good question. Is it uniformity? I'd say no, it's not. You say, what do you mean uniformity? I mean that everybody is exactly like everybody else. Uniformity. I mean everybody looks the same. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody talks the same. Everybody uh, thinks the same, tastes the same. No, that's not exactly unity. We should recognize that and understand that in this congregation. There are many people in this room that have different backgrounds, and because you have different backgrounds, you have different tastes and different opinions and different viewpoints. And what's interesting to me, that's one of the beauties of First Baptist Church, is that it's much like the first century church in the fact that the church often found unity in the midst of real and passionate differences. You go to the New Testament, especially in a church like the church at Ephesus, and you have Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. Here are groups that had different languages, different backgrounds, different customs, and most certainly different opinions, and yet they were thriving together and striving together for the furtherance of the gospel. 
So unity is not uniformity. In fact, I would worry about a church that was in complete uniformity, meaning this, I don't think a church should be overly homogenized. Meaning, I think sometimes you have a church that all they do is they target a certain demographic. They want young people. And so what they do is they make their church look like a warehouse and they turn down the lights and make it kind of look like a bar or a warehouse and they're rocking it out and they're hip, being all hipster and the, the, the pastor wears skinny blue jeans and uh, you know tank tops or whatever and he, and he jives with the people and he just raps on their level because after all he doesn't care about anybody else. All he wants is young people. But then there are also churches, they don't care about the young people. All they care about is the people they've always had. And bless God, this is the way we always do it. And there, Look, a church shouldn't be overly too homogenized. There are some groups that want just a certain uh, socioeconomic standard. They want a certain uh, maybe a, a wealth class and, or maybe a certain lack of wealth class. And I want you to know what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated, if you're rich, you're poor, you're black, you're white, anything in between. What I'm trying to say to you is a church is not after uniformity. They're trying to have unity. So it's not exactly the same. All right? So how about this? Is it the absence of fighting? Well, not necessarily. Just because you're not fighting doesn't necessarily mean you're unified. All right. Now, let's, let's understand. Not fighting in church, that's a good thing. I mean, it's good when you're not having people in fist fights in the parking lot. I remember one time, you know, there are a lot of things they don't teach you in Bible college. And I remember one time when I was uh, early in my pastoring, in North Carolina, I was uh, uh, sitting on the platform like I would do here, and uh, the ushers were getting ready to take the offering. And so we had some, uh, uh, a variety of men serving as ushers, but we had uh, several older gentlemen that served as ushers. And I remember I was sitting up here, and we had a, a gentleman in our church. He was well into his 80s. He was a, a much older gentleman, and he was even well into his 80s, approaching 90. He was very, very ticklish. Very ticklish. Now, I didn't know this. I learned this, but he's very, very ticklish. And since he was very, very ticklish, he did not like people tickling him, which would make sense. That's kind of weird if you're trying to tickle a 90-year-old man. But nevertheless, there was another man who was also in his 80s, and he was a jokester. He, his last name was Gordon. They called him Flash Gordon, you know, and he was just a, a, a joking kind of guy. And he came up behind the brother that's very ticklish, he wasn't trying to tickle him, but he just kind of poked him in the side, in the back, just to, I guess, to say, hey, bud, how you doing? Well, when he did, the guy who was very ticklish, who's approaching 90, turned around and punched him. <laughs> and when he punched him, the Flash grabbed him, and they're wrestling, and I'm on the platform. I got, I got two senior citizens duking it out in the lobby. Uh, guys, stop. We got to take offering, you know. What, what are you doing? It's not good to have... 90-year-old guys beating each other up in the lobby. It's not good having 20-year-old guys beating each other up in the lobby. And so I'm thankful when there's no fighting in church, but just because you're not fighting doesn't necessarily mean that you have unity. Well, then is it union? Because we're all members of this church. We're all members of one body, so we are uh, unified then. Well, not necessarily. You can have union without having unity. For example, you could take two cats, you could tie their tails together and throw them over a clothesline. They would have union, but they would not be unified. You understand what I'm saying? And, and I think sometimes that could happen in a church. Oh, we, we have union. I'm a member, you're a member. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have unity. Okay, well, then is it, what are you trying to say, preacher? Are you trying to say that unity is when everybody holds hands and sings kumbaya? And, no, I don't even think God likes that song, to be honest with you. I, I really think he, he hates the song kumbaya, and so I don't know why that's the theme song for everybody holding hands and swaying. And uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we, if we're going to be a unified church, that's just what we do. We have like syrupy talk, and we just all hold hands. And Oh, I love you, brother. I love you, too. Uh, that's not necessarily what I'm, what I'm talking about. I, I think when we say everybody's got to be best buds, I, I wouldn't suggest that. You know, I recognize there are different personalities, different types, and, and the Bible doesn't command us that we have to be best buddies with everybody. In fact, the Bible says that uh, 
you know, don't make friends with an angry man. So it tells us there's certain people you, you shouldn't be friends with. And, and I like that old poem. Maybe you've heard it before, but I like it. It says, to dwell above with those we love, well, that will be glory. To dwell below with those we know, well, that's a different story. And, and I understand you're not going to be best friends with everybody and anybody that attends a church, but what then do we mean if it's none of these things, what does it mean to have unity? Well, the word unity really carries the idea of having harmony. Having harmony. Different chords, different, different uh, notes blending together, making a beautiful sound. Um, it's kind of like this. I remember when I was in high school and we had to take a computer class, which was, of course, very beneficial, and we had to learn how to type. Because uh, it's, it's a helpful thing in this day and age of digital vices to not have to type like this. Right? So they would teach. And I remember the teacher that I had as a uh, teaching typing was like the proverbial stereotypical librarian. All right? She was in her 60s and she had those glasses with the beads that kept them. I mean, this, this lady was like librarian and she had the monotone voice. I remember she started off telling us where the home keys were. And so we were to place our fingers on the home keys. And she would say, J, 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 E, E. And you just do this all day until you learned how to type. And so they would try and teach you how to type and uh, you would want to get proficient in where you could look at what it is you were typing without even paying attention to your fingers. But I don't know if you've ever done this when you were typing. Have you ever looked at what you were typing and you're typing away, typing away, and then you looked and you realized that your fingers were not on the home keys, they were moved over once? <laughs> you ever done that? Oh, man. Well, that's not in harmony. That's not together and it creates a jumbled mess that looks ridiculous and is not legible and, and and the idea of unity is different parts that are not the same working together for the right cause in harmony in unison to get the job done so obviously we could see the application that it would have for first baptist church oh we we understand that having a pastor is a very very important thing for a church the Bible says that God gave certain churches pastors. And every church needs a pastor. Don't kid yourself. We need a pastor. And so in the event, Paul, when he was leaving Ephesus, he said, hey, I want you to be very aware because it would be easy for Satan. And uh, to, he, he talks about this imagery of those that getting in and, and creating division and creating trouble. You, you don't want that. You want to stay unified together, striving together, working together for the furtherance of the gospel. So I want to give you this morning in the time that we have left three questions about dwelling together in unity. Three questions about dwelling together in unity. And I'll try and give them as quickly as I can. First of all, in what points, in what points should we have unity? Meaning, what, where are we to be unified? How are we supposed to be unified? Now, the first thing I'd like to say, and I think this is vitally important, and that is we need to be unified in the truth. In the truth. I've said to you over these last two and a half years that it is the truth that brings us together and binds us together. It's not our preferences in food. It's not our economic backgrounds, our educational backgrounds. It's not the shades of our skin tones. It's none of those things. It's always about the truth that brings us together. I think I recently told you in another message along the same lines that I was at Walmart and I saw a man and he was wearing a belt, bibbed overalls, and suspenders. I mean, his, his pants weren't going anywhere. And what held him together were those straps and those devices. And I want you to know that that's what's going to hold this church together. Uh, the church is not held together by a single man. A church is not held together by a single family. The church is held together by truth. It's what binds us together. It's what brought us together, and it's what keeps us together. I want to say, in, in, and by the way, since it's the truth that brings us together and keeps us together, the truth of God's Word is non-negotiable. So secondly, I'd say it's our affection. 
It's our love for the truth that we just talked about. It's our love for, for God. And that keeps us and binds us together, and that's where we should have unity. We love God. And then I want to say it's also our duty. Duty is doing what ought to be done. The right thing to do. Can I say something about unity and, and duty? You cannot do what ought to be done without each other. You can. God orchestrated and designed it that way. You need to understand something about the Bible. The Bible says that we cannot grow spiritually the way we ought without each other. This idea that I can grow spiritually on my own and I can worship God in a tree stand or in front of the TV somewhere, that is so unbiblical and so foreign to what the Bible teaches. You need each other and you must band together. I have a simple illustration for you here. I have a pencil. I don't know if you did this when you were in school, but we did. Uh, you had to have a number two pencil. And the truth is, I've always wondered this, is there any number other than a number two pencil? <laughs> and I've never gone to the store and said, hey, there's some pencils. Oh, they're number six. I can't, you know, they're, they're always number two. And what is number two? I don't know. Anyway, that's, I guess, a sermon for another day. But here is a pencil, and this is a number two pencil, and we would get these pencils, and my parents would buy pencils, and you'd need them for school and, and uh, that kind of thing. But did you guys ever, when you were in school, did you ever do pencil break? Yeah, we, we used to do pencil break. And what we would do is we'd pull the, pull the eraser out of the top, and you'd bite the metal piece down so it has a sharp edge to it. And you, your buddy would hold his pencil like this, and you'd flick it down like that and take a whack at it, and then he'd take a whack at it, and you'd just keep whacking it and whacking it and whacking until somebody's pencil finally broke. Great use of my parents' hard-earned dollars, you know, right? And uh, I hope no kids are in here listening to me about that, but that, that's what we did with our pencils. And, you know, a pencil is rather easy by itself to break. I'm not a super strong man, but I, I, I can break a pencil. But if I take those same pencils and I bind them together... There might be somebody in here that could do it, but it ain't me. <laughs> you know? And the illustration stands for itself. Uh, if a church by itself, a Christian by itself, easily snapped in two. But bound together in unity, one with another, it becomes increasingly stronger. Number two, with what people should we have unity? Meaning, who, who are we to be unified with? Look at our verse there. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for, notice this, brethren. Brethren. So, I, I won't spend a lot of time because we don't have the time today, but I think you could talk a long time about how families ought to be in unison. Meaning, fathers, mothers, and children all together. It's unfortunate today that we has such a dysfunction, a dysfunction and a, a disjointing in our family units in America today where we have a lot of families where there is no father either even present. And if he is present, he's, he's just a bum that just doesn't do anything, that uh, sits around, has no spiritual leadership whatsoever in his family. And, and we got uh, mothers who are running the uh, show and not cooperating with fathers, and fathers not even there. And, th and then we have issues where it's the kids running the show. And, and all of this, I mean, I hope I didn't ruffle any feathers on that, but that's out of scheme for what the Bible says. And we have a dysfunction and a disunity within the home. And the Bible says that brethren or family units ought to be together. Okay, but let's make the application since that's where we're dwelling so much today. And how about the brethren of a, of a church? Because I like the poetry. It may be a little hard to follow, but if you think about it slowly, in verses 2 and 3, David takes the truth of verse 1 and he kind of illustrates it in verses 2 and 3. And so what he says, he says, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran, upon the, uh, ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And so I want you to get this imagery because it's kind of, it's kind of different. It's maybe not the way I would have suggested, but Aaron, when he was anointed the high priest, it was customary in those days to pour an anointing oil, whether it was a king or a priest, 
uh, they would appoint, uh, pour this anointing oil over their head to symbolize that they were now in that position. So it'd be kind of like today in our, uh, when a dignitary takes office, maybe he would swear in or take an oath, or uh, when somebody becomes a citizen, they take an oath, or so, something along those lines. It was symbolic of that. And so they would pour oil over uh, Aaron's head as he became the priest, and he had a beard. And so maybe this isn't, again, the picturesque imagery that, that I would have come up with, but I can see this oil running down, and it gets in his beard, and, it, and it's kind of running through his beard, and it's dripping down through his beard, kind of like some of you, if they have beards, that eat soup, you know, and it's just like it's coming down, and, and, and it's dripping down the front of his garments, and maybe it's plopping down on his, on his shoes, it's coming down, and you say, well, why did he say that? Because in the first verse, he said, behold how good and how pleasant it is, and when I'm thinking of oil and stuff running through a guy's facial hair, hmm, no, the idea is what he is saying is when, this is, when this happens, it trickles down and is a benefit to everybody else. He, he says the same thing. He says it's like the dew. It's like the snow-capped hills of a mountain. And it trickles down into the valley. And it, it's a blessing to, to those down below. And we can certainly relate to that in our area when when there's not the proper precipitation on the mountaintops, it certainly affects the precipitation on the lower levels and the valleys and the drier areas of our, of our uh, area. And so he says it flows down to everyone, everywhere. And he says it's a benefit. It's a benefit. So you think about that when a church is in unison, when it is unified. Man, I think of the friendly atmosphere that is created in a unified church. I mean, that doesn't mean that you have to do everything that everybody wants, but you can't be friendly about it. And let me tell you, when a visitor comes into a church that's at odds with one another, they can sense it right away. Don't kid yourself. When a, when a visitor comes into a church where people are together and they're excited to see each other and they're excited to worship with one another, they can pick up on that as well. And it's a blessing and a benefit to others. I, I want you to know that I'm trying to encourage you to be friendly. Don't be antagonistic towards people. Why don't you learn to give the benefit of the doubt to people? Let me tell you one thing, if I can pastor you for just a moment. We need to be very, very careful going forward today about this area of gossip. And it's very, very easy to say, did you hear? Did you hear? Do you know what's going to happen? And, and man, speculation and assumption and storytelling start taking place. And that will create division amongst people about as quick as anything. Never criticize. Never criticize. I'm not saying you can't be discerning, but remember there is a fine, fine line between criticism and discernment. And sometimes churches, they get all upset. I mean, membership, well, I'll tell you, I don't like the way this is handled. I don't like the way the preacher did that. I don't like the way the pulpit committee's done. I don't, look, don't criticize. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Let's maintain unity. All right, so let me say lastly, in the time we have left, to what purpose should we have unity? Uh, what purpose should we have unity? Why then should we be unified? I'll say to you, first of all, so that others will see it. Notice it says there the very first word, behold. Look at that. Isn't that a good thing? You see, I'll, I'll just speak plain, I might as well, I... I've tried to speak plain for two and a half years. I might as well not quit now. But you know, there are going to be some, I, I imagine there are going to be some people tempted. Well, if Pastor Jones is in here, I'm not coming. <laughs> I'll be fair. There might be saying, since Pastor Jones is gone, I'm coming back. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you know what? I, I think that it would, be a, it would be a wonderful thing to say, Behold. Look at that. Even though a curveball was thrown, even though some disruption was presented, behold, as a band of believers, it stuck together. I like that old song, Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward then ye people, join our happy throng. And I hope as First Baptist Church continues to march forward that people would behold that and say, hey, I'd like to be a part of that. 
about number two, not only so that others will see it, number two, for the good of others. It says, behold, how good. It's good for individuals. It's good for the whole group, and it's most certainly good for the Lord. I came across a little parable. I'd like to kind of read it to you. I thought it was pretty good, and I think you'll like it. This little parable is called a parable about the carpenter's shop. And the way the parable goes is that in this carpenter shop, the tools were, were arguing. They were at odds with one another, and they were fighting, and they were not unified, and so they had a conference to try and settle things. The hammer was presiding over this particular conference, but several in the conference suggested that the hammer should have to leave the meeting because the hammer was just way too noisy. It's always banging around. And they wanted the hammer out of there. And the hammer said, well, okay, I'll leave then, but if I have to leave, then the screw has to go also. He said, because the screw, you know, you have to turn him around and around and around again and again and again to get him to accomplish anything. I want the screw out of here. So then the screw speaks up and he says, well, if you want me to leave, I'm going to leave, but the plane, he's going to have to leave too. Because everything, all the work that the plane does is only on the surface. His efforts have absolutely no depth. So then the plane said, all right, well, fine, I'll leave too. But if I leave, then the sandpaper has to go. Because you know he's so rough, he's always rubbing people the wrong way. So in the midst of all this arguing and carrying on, in walks the carpenter. The carpenter happened to be working on a pulpit. That pulpit was going to be used to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he picked up the hammer, as he picked up the plane and the sandpaper, and the screws and the bolts and the other tools, he used them all together. And when the day was done, the Saul spoke up and he said, Brethren, I observe that all of us are workers together with the Master. I think there's a great lesson to that parable, isn't there? Yeah, there are some people like the sandpaper that rub the wrong way. There are some people that are stubborn that need to be turned again and again and again. And there are some hammers that make a lot of noise. But if all of those tools can take what talents and benefits they have and work together, they can create a platform where the gospel of Jesus Christ can be proclaimed. So we should be unified so that others will see it for the good of others, and then lastly, for pleasure in life. It says there, behold how good and how pleasant. It's like harmony in music. I'm not a great musician, uh, but I can recognize when somebody's singing well and when somebody ain't. And while I might not be able to make wonderful music, my daughter played the piano. I enjoyed that. And I enjoy hearing Miss Mimi play and how she's singing in Psalm 50. I love that. And I, I, I love hearing good singing in our church. I love that special that the choir sang this morning and different voices and different parts blending together for unity and harmony. Man, that's a pleasant thing. Have you ever been in church before and the guy behind you was making a joyful noise unto the Lord? And it's pleasant when you hear good music. The Bible uses a word in its pages, it's, it's odious. Have you ever heard that? It talks about an odious woman. When I read the Proverbs and I saw an odious woman, I always thought it meant stinky woman. That's not what the word odious means. The word odious in the Bible means it's somebody that causes hatred or strong dislike. It's, it, it means very offensive. But then I began to think, maybe it's connected to the word odor. I mean, I don't know. I haven't really researched the etymology of the word. Maybe I should have, but odor can be real offensive. It can hinder unity. You, you know what I'm saying? I remember when I was, uh, before I went to Bible college, I attended another university. And I lived in the dorms. You don't get to pick who your roommates are. They just assign them to you. And it's just one me and one other guy in our room. 
And I remember uh, I saw this guy walking around on campus, and I kind of cracked a joke about him. I said, hey, Dad, look at that guy. Made fun of him. My dad kind of made fun of him, too. And I ran up to my room. I hadn't met my roommate yet, and my dad was waiting to take me to dinner. And I ran back down. I said, Dad, you ain't going to believe who my roommate is. He said, that guy we were just cracking on in. I said, yeah. He said, well, that's what you get. Well, this guy had grown up in another country. And uh, I guess his uh, hygiene habits weren't exactly the same as I thought they should be. And, and, and he thought that I'm, I'm a shower at least every day kind of guy, maybe twice a day when needed. He believed in taking a shower once a week whether you needed one or not. <laughs> he also hadn't been introduced to the concept of deodorant. He, he also got a job working at the school cafeteria. And he also hadn't been introduced to laundry soap either. So he would go to the cafeteria and wash dishes, and he would sweat profusely without the aid of deodorant. He would come home, and he would put his clothes into the corner of the room and wait till tomorrow. And by the way, after a couple of days of this, he, could, he didn't have to hang them up. They just stood up over there, you know? <laughs> and so here we are in this little, I don't know, I doubt the room was even 12 by 12, the two of us there, and his lack of hygiene and his working, and I, I just... I just couldn't take it anymore, you know what I mean? Especially when a friend came over, we were going to go play basketball, and he came over to my room, he walked in, he said, whoa, ho, ho. and he told me, he said, I will never come to your room again. He said, how do you live like that? I said, it's tough, tell me. So I remember it was very, very difficult, I had to sit down uh, with this guy, and it was one of those things, man, I'm, I'm only 17, 18 years of age, and these are good life lessons. My mom and dad are hours away. I mean, it's just me. So what do you do? You either get a clothespin and stick it on your nose and study. You go to the library. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what you do. So the only thing I knew to do is I, I say, hey, man, I need to talk to you. Okay. No, 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 we need to sit down and talk. Okay. I remember looking at him and him looking at me and said, I got a problem. It's not easy to look at somebody and say, you stink. <laughs> but I had to sit there and tell you, like, look, if we're going to live in this same 12 by 12 space together, there's going to be, have to be some give and take. And you're going to have to, here's what we're, you're going to have to give. you got to take a shower every day. When you get home from work, you have to take a shower. And when you get in there, don't just get wet. Shampoo and soap. <laughs> and you got to wash your clothes. That's what you've got to give. And this is what I said. Here's what I'm willing to give. I will buy you the soap, the shampoo, the deodorant. I will buy you whatever you need, my friend. <laughs> because we're in this thing together. <laughs> We've got months to go before the semester ends. And I want to get along with you. And I hope you want to get along with me. You know what he said? He said, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. And you know, he started taking a shower every day. And our room started smelling a whole lot better. <laughs> you know, I, my friends would come by my room again. You, you know, and, and, and you know, that semester finished on a strong note. I transferred to Bible college, but I came back to visit him, but he got another roommate. Do you know that other roommate was not as clean as I am? And things regressed. But I think they enjoyed one another, to be honest with you. <laughs> they were dwelling together in a different sort of unity. But I tell you that crazy illustration to tell you this. When two people are working together, two different people from different backgrounds, even different preferences, when they dwell together in unity, it is pleasant. It's pleasant. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Have you found unity? It's in Christ and His truth. Question number two. 
Is this unity evident in your life? Question number three. Are you achieving some purpose in your unity? Because sometimes you can be unified, but you're not doing anything. Have you achieved purpose in your unity? I think the application is very simple. I'd like to wrap it up in this. Friend, if you've never been saved, you are not in unity with your Creator, and you need to be. And the good news is today you can be. But maybe you've been saved and you're right with God. You're in unity with Him as far as your standing is concerned. What about it in this church? What I'd like to encourage all of you to do today is many of you are able to make altars out of your chairs or fill up the altar here. I, I would sure hope that so many of you would say, you know what, I love First Baptist Church. God has led me to First Baptist Church. I'm a member at First Baptist Church. And I want unity to be supreme here as we go forward. We're not going to go backward. We're going to go forward in unity, striving together with one another. Not striving against each other. Working with each other in unity for the glory of God.